I'm going to talk today about uh, my, my uh, topic is rethinking the customer journey. It's taken from my latest book, The Ultimate Marketing Engine. So let's get in. I want to take you back in time just a little bit to uh, March 15th, 2020. For most of us, when I mentioned that date, they have a pretty darn good idea of, of what they might have been doing uh, at that particular day. It was a Sunday, um, and of course, you know, we all were kind of wrestling with, is the world going to <laughs> come to an end here? Uh, I received a text um, from a longtime client. Um, it was a very long text that, that was essentially the content of uh, an email that he was going to send to his 50 plus employees and to his dozens of projects that he had uh, going with clients. He was a remodeling contractor and he was in the middle of tearing up people's kitchens and bathrooms and things. And he was basically saying, hey, don't come into work on Monday. Nobody's going to show up at the job site on Monday. We're stopping all work. We're stopping all projects. A uh, tough email to send. But I was struck by almost immediately the responses that came back in. Uh, they all had a tone of, you're doing the right thing. We're with you. Uh, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> we'll, we'll be here when, you know, when you're able to get back to work safely. Uh, one person even offered to pay for uh, their project that hadn't even got started in advance. And it's shown such a bright light to me on something that has really always been true, but somehow we've gotten away from it, I feel. And that is that in good times, you know, businesses, a lot of businesses thrive and survive just by being in the right place at the right time, capturing demand. But in tough times, businesses often succeed by being important in the lives of their customers. And I think we all saw that in very, very you know, plain view for what has gone on in the last 18 months. But, but still today, in many circles, particularly digital circles, this is still what we're promoting. Let's run people through this funnel and get them to do what we want them to do. Let's do funnel hacking. Let's, let's get obsessed with the, the new tactic of the week. And I get it. <laughs> I mean, marketing uh, particularly is changing rapidly. So, I, in fact, I, I, marketers love statistics. I'll share a few statistics with you today uh, to, to put a fine point on that. Uh, why we're so tactic obsessed. 61% of mobile searchers are more likely to contact a local business if they have a mobile friendly site. I mean, that's just, we got to have that today. In some industries, it's probably the only way that they're going to contact us. 87% of potential customers won't consider a business with low ratings. So now all of those places where people can go and voluntarily leave uh, messages about our brand, of which we have no longer have any control over, we have to try to, to influence and be a part of. 64% of consumers say watching a video on Facebook has influenced a purchase decision. So we all know we got to be on social media, but now, of course, we have to be on all the platforms. And now we have to actually continually mold our content to exactly the way that those content platforms want to see uh, our content. And it changes seemingly daily. 92% of consumers will visit a brand's website for the first time for reasons other than making a purchase. I mean, our websites have a lot of jobs to do. Uh, so no wonder marketers, digital marketers in particular, have gotten so obsessed with the tactics. But I want to share two more statistics with you that I think hopefully will start you thinking about this idea of a more full customer journey, or at least rethinking your current customer journey. 86% of buyers, this is a recent PricewaterhouseCooper survey of 2,000 consumers, uh, 80% of them, 86% of them said they would pay more for a better customer experience. I know I will. I mean, heck, 86% is practically all of us. So maybe, maybe there's some money in actually paying attention to what happens after somebody becomes a customer. Now, here's another one that has been true for as long as I've been doing this, which is a long time. 83% of business owners claim that their main source of new business is referrals. There was a recent Texas Tech survey that actually uh, found that, that an even higher percent, they, in their survey, 86% 
of the people they surveyed said, yes, they had a business that they loved, a business they would evangelize, a business they would surely refer to their friends and neighbors. 86%. And yet, only 29% of them actually did refer. So maybe (laughs) there's some money in closing that gap, that 50%, 50 plus percent gap between those who love our businesses and those who actually become active referral participants. See, with all the talk about changes in marketing, the thing that's really changed the most is how people can choose to become customers. You know, that linear kind of funnel-based path of creating demand, I I just don't think it exists anymore today. In fact, many of the ways in which people come to choose the businesses that they do business with are out of our control. Quite often, a business or a person has decided or not decided to buy from us before we even know that they're trying to solve a problem, before we even know they're out there searching. And so that, that straight linear path of customer demand just doesn't exist anymore. And I'd like to suggest the customer journey looks a heck of a lot more like this. And that our job, I think, as marketers is less about creating demand and really more about organizing behavior. Less about getting them to do what we want them to do and more about guiding them on the journey that they actually want to take. And I want to introduce a a new framework for the thought of the customer journey. Everybody's familiar, of course, with the the, the marketing funnel. I have for many, many years uh, been talking about a framework I call the marketing hourglass. Now, if you think about the hourglass metaphor, it, it certainly borrows. I mean, the top half borrows from the funnel. I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with getting some percentage of the market to know what we have and know that we exist and an even smaller percentage of that market to, to realize they are ideal customers. But where I do object is that for many marketers, that's where it ends. And I believe that we, at the point at which somebody becomes a customer, <clears throat> we flip that hour, uh, or we flip that funnel over to form the hourglass because that's where I think the real opportunity to shine exists. So my marketing hourglass, my customer journey has seven stages. They are no like trust, try by, repeat, and refer. And I believe those are more closely aligned with the behaviors that we as buyers want to go through, want to participate in with the businesses that we do business with. And it doesn't re- it's not really hard to test this idea too. Think about your own buying habits. If you have a problem or a challenge, <clears throat> rather than awareness or consideration, you want to know who can solve that problem. That's certainly uh, the the first step in really kind of any kind of purchase journey. And then once you find somebody, you refer somebody, you do a search out there and you find uh, a business that you want to check out, we're making that snap decision. We go to their website. Does it look like it was updated in the last 10 years? Does it load slowly? Uh, Does it make sense? Do they seem to feature uh, you know, people like me that, uh, that that they help. I mean, we're making those snap decisions to like or decide not to like um, some business really almost <clears throat> immediately. In fact, we won't invest in filling out a form or, or calling unless we then start digging in and think, okay, do I trust that they can solve my problem? Have they solved other people? Um, are, is there social proof? Uh, do they seem like an expert uh, in their industry? Can they demonstrate that? We want that level of trust before we're really going to invest any time and energy in in checking out if they have the right solution for us. And then I don't know about you, but I love it when a business gives me the opportunity to experience or try what it would be like to work there with them. And of course, in the digital world, we're all so familiar with the 30-day software trial, but truly any way, shape, and form in which somebody is experiencing your business they're trying. Uh, filling out a form is a trial. Picking up the phone and calling your business is a trial. So the point is, as marketers, what are we doing to intentionally guide people through these? What are we doing to intentionally answer the questions and objectives at each of these stages? And of course, we all love to buy. I know I do. 
but we've also all been let down when we've made a purchase. Buyer's remorse is a real, real thing. So what are we doing to keep that experience, that transaction, that onboarding, that, that discovery, uh, that communication? What are we doing to intentionally build those processes into the buying experience? And then, of course, most of us, if we find a company, let's say it's a dentist <laughs> that, that we like, they're convenient, they do a good job. Uh, we, we don't mind, uh, you know, the work that they do. We don't go out next time we need to get our teeth cleaned and start shopping around for a lower price. We like that convenience. We like to have uh, boxes checked off that we don't have to think about anymore. We just call them up when it's time. And then lastly, I think as humans, we're, we're wired to refer businesses. We're certainly wired to talk about uh, experiences that surprise us or exceed our expectations. And yet... <clears throat> So few businesses, so many businesses generate a significant amount of their business by way of referrals. So few do it intentionally. So the idea behind this is that we actually build uh, our marketing planning out based first and foremost on guiding people through this customer journey. So let's go through a couple of the, the things that would show up in each of these stages. Now, when I do this uh, in workshop format, um, I will quite often just ask people, okay, how do people come to know about your business? And that's the one that everybody can answer. We got to run ads, uh, we uh, search marketing, we produce content, we participate in social media, we get referrals, uh, we've got a sales team that does outreaching, outreach, we go to networking events. I mean, everybody gets those. But it's these next two stages that, to me, really build or set the stage for a long-term relationship. Because so many businesses try to go from no to buy. And that's fine. We want people to buy from us, right? And sometimes it works. But the problem with that is that's also how we attract customers that don't appreciate our value, don't understand why they should expect to pay a premium to work with us, just aren't ideal because they don't have the right circumstance or the right problem. So in like and trust, we're sending a lot of those messages. We're doing the education, telling our story, um, showing them what a user experience on our website uh, should look like, giving them visual cues that help them understand, oh, wow, you're, you know, you, your content appears in all these uh, high profile places. You've got tons of social proof. Uh, you've got reviews and testimonials and case studies. You know, these are the things that set us up for a long term relationship with clients. The next two stages are really what I call the bridge to this long term success. Quite frankly, most people wait and think, oh, yeah, we need to generate more referrals after the fact. But referrals are actually generated. <laughs> When somebody is trying you and the, and the experience they have buying from you or the, or, or the fulfillment um, of what it is or whatever it is that they bought. Um, and so these are two stages that I think are often uh, overlooked. Uh, but this is where you set the table for, for momentum. This is where you set the table for retention. Uh, this is where you set the table for, for leveling up and selling more uh, to, to your existing clients. And so everything that happens in the tribe, you know, quote requests, phone calls, evaluations, forms, you know, more trial content, you know, low cost options. These are all just options that can go into the, the, the tribe bucket. Uh, but again, Experience tells me that you know most companies, um, marketing, sales, service, are just kind of doing their thing, and there's no end-to-end -end customer journey where people are intentionally thinking about the experience that somebody wants to have. You know, in 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 the first few stages, um, the customers out there on their own, the prospects out there on their own, doing searching, looking at your website, downloading content, maybe, but once they move to this stage. They're starting to experience your business. It is on you, the business, to make sure to understand the experience they want to have. When's the last time you looked at your transaction process? <laughs> you know, a lot of uh, a lot of technology changes uh, dramatically. I hate to I hate to throw props to Amazon, but you know they set the bar <laughs> for for transactions. Uh, what's your onboarding of a new customer look like? What's your orientation? Uh, of a new customer look like? What's your communication? How do you set the expectation for how you're going to communicate results or, or you know, ongoing process? Um, and then, you know, lastly, uh, the, these last few stages, a lot of people think of content 
purely for getting the order, purely for getting the attention. Well, a great opportunity for some really rich content is after somebody buys, um, after they become a customer, certainly all the way through uh, referral. So the last two stages, <laughs> repeat and referral. This is how you scale you know, your business, uh, is with your existing customers. I know everybody knows this, but I think it, it, it's worth repeating. And that is that it is far easier <laughs> to do more business with someone you've already established a level of trust with than it is to go out there and find new people <laughs> to develop that same level of trust. So right off the bat, you know, many, many businesses, retention is, is how they grow. I mean, if, if, if you're churning out, you know, every, uh, a customer for every new one you bring in, there's, there's no scale, there's no growth opportunity. So what is the retention process? What's your continued education look like? A lot of times people will buy a product or service um, and, and companies that do a good job at showing them how to get more out of what they bought. Um, I think certainly uh, retain those customers for a long time. They up level them to new products and services. Um, I, you know, I've, almost every service business, uh, particularly, <laughs> but even product businesses, you know, should have um, an intentional way to find a way to do 10 times more business with their best customers, or maybe 100 times more business, whether it's through offering um, you know, higher priced offerings. Once you've got somebody that you're solving their problems, um, quite often uh, they, will, they will go with, along with you for the ride. If you can prove to them, you can produce even more value. And then of course, referrals. Most businesses that even receive some level of referrals, uh, I think, do it in a lot of cases uh, accidentally. So what are you doing to stay top of mind with all of your customers? What are you doing to reward or really incentivize those champion customers, the ones that love you, the ones that are already talking about you? And then lastly, the last couple of categories here, most of the time when people think about referrals, they quite naturally default to their customers. And I get that. I mean, your customers know how brilliant you are. But the real opportunity in many cases is developing strategic partner relationships. Those businesses that also have your ideal customer as part of their customer base. In some cases, if you can demonstrate how you can bring value to them, they might introduce you to 500, 1,000, 10,000 <laughs> prospects where the you know, your best customers might know six, eight, 10 people at the most. So developing, intentionally developing ways to uh, work with partners, to co-market with partners, uh, to teach referrals, take your customer base and, and actually teach them uh, how to generate referrals if you're in a B2B environment is a way to, to actually scale and grow with your customers. So this framework, the Marketing Hourglass, is, is how I would like you to start thinking about uh, the customer journey. Uh, no like, trust, try, buy, repeat, and refer. And here's the thing. You know, with everything we've gone through the last 18 months, I hate to say that there's any true positive from it. But one of the things that has happened is, you know, change sometimes is what, what stops people from becoming our customers. They just, change is hard. Why fix it? It's not broken. <laughs> Well, everything's broken now. <laughs> so people are looking for opportunities. People are willing to change right now. People want and expect a better customer experience today. So if you have some innovation that you've been holding on to, now's the time to bring it to the world. All right, I wanna change gears uh, for just a moment and take this up another level. So any Stranger Things fans? Um, generally, when I speak to audiences, there's a few hoots and hollers <laughs> when I show this uh, slide because, hey, who doesn't love this show? Now, some of you might be wondering, why in the world am I showing this particular picture? Steve on the left there uh, is wearing an, uh, an article that I really, of clothing that I want to point out. Again, <clears throat> if I were uh, in front of a live audience right now uh, and you're uh, in the audience and you're over 40, <laughs> you probably know that what Steve is wearing is a member's only jacket. This was a big, big item, trendy, trendy thing back in the uh, early 80s. Uh, I had one, certainly. Um, many of my friends had them, and then I looked up one day and I was a, a, a member only. 
their, their time had passed. But you can still get these on uh, some vintage sites and uh, maybe an Etsy site or something. But here's the reason that I uh, am going down this rabbit hole. What if we began to think of our customers more like members? Now, I don't mean a membership program or a subscription program or, heaven forbid, Costco. I mean, those are all great business models. But I'm talking more about a point of view. What if we, what if we saw what a, what a customer was doing was joining our company as opposed to you know, becoming a customer? See, because here's the thing. You know, customers will go out there and they'll do research. A member, somebody who, who believes in what we're doing or believes that, 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 that we have something that will change their life. I mean, they engage with that organization. A customer purchases, a member sees what they're doing as an investment. A customer will refer. You do a good job, somebody asks them, they'll refer. But a member is going to go out there and say, oh, wait, no, you have got to work with these people. They are unbelievable. So what if we started to think less about the transactions that are available to us and more about the transformations that our customers are seeking. Now, I know that even if you fundamentally agree with that idea, you might be thinking, well, that's great, <laughs> but how do I make that real? How do I make that practical? I've developed and, and outlined in, in uh, the book, The Ultimate Marketing Engine, something I call the customer success track. And it starts with these five critical questions. And there's way too much on this slide. You might take a picture or something if, if you want to recall it. I'll go through it pretty quickly. But it essentially, what, what it amounts to is to go to work on understanding the stage or stages that your current customers are in now and where they want to go. Now, most businesses work with businesses or, or individuals that are typically in one or maybe a couple stages. Maybe they have a couple different segments. But those people, I mean, you, your salespeople, <laughs> you know, can define those because of the, who those people are because there, there are defining characteristics. We know what the challenges uh, they're trying to solve are. And most businesses, whether they say this or do this or not, you know, we as businesses kind of develop the milestones. I mean, what, what are the tasks we have to uh, accomplish in order to solve uh, that, uh, that customer's problem? So, for example, I provide marketing consulting to uh, businesses. Quite often, they come to us and, and are looking for a systematic approach to marketing because they haven't had one. So they, they have foundational things that need to be fixed or, or even added. Um, and we know what those are. We know what the characteristics, we know the problems that's causing them. But we also know exactly what activities or milestones we have to take in order to move them out of that stage so that we could start producing customers, so we could start producing leads for them. So we know at each of these stages what the promise is of moving through that stage. So the idea here is that you know, we develop a stage a customer comes in. We know the characteristics there, the challenges they're experiencing. We know the milestones, and then we know the promise. Now, a word about milestones. I mean, milestones are such a great tool to use in trying to understand your customer, trying to understand how to move your customer, how to produce results for your customers. Because milestone questions can only be answered yes or no. So we don't ask a milestone question that is something like, does the, you know, does the website, is the website effective? I mean, who knows? Uh, that's just not a great question. But one milestone might be, does the website look and load effectively on a mobile device? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, check the box. If the answer is no, we have a set of tasks that we know we need to complete. So the idea behind this then is to say, okay, what would it look like if we built out advanced stages? I mean, if somebody came to us in their earliest stage and we want to build a marketing foundation so they can build some, some growth and, and then ultimately build scale and maybe ultimately exit the business, those are all stages that we can understand how to accomplish. So we just start stacking those stages on top of each other. And the beauty of this is that it demonstrates to a business that, that we know where they are today, that we can fix today's problem, but here's the roadmap for where we're going. This is the entire customer success track 
the, the mission of our business then becomes guiding people, guiding customers, businesses, whoever you're working with, from where they are today to where they want to go. Now, one of the beauties of this idea is that while it on the surface may sound like a marketing tactic, and <clears throat> again, if you pick up the Ultimate Marketing Engine, you're going to find I've built an entire a companion website of resources that will allow you to actually take and copy our entire marketing <laughs> customer success track for your business or if you work with other businesses. But my real goal in presenting this idea is that I think any business can build this for their customers. And when they do, it truly can become, in many ways, the overarching mission for the business. So many companies struggle with this idea of mission and they try to write pretty words and, and you know, shove a couple core values into, into those, but they really don't drive anything. They don't mean anything. But imagine the mission as simple as taking our customers from where they are to where they want to go. You know, we banter around this idea of customer centric, you know, marketing or customer centric businesses. Well, simplify your mission in that way. And you might actually <laughs> become one. It certainly <clears throat> changes the messaging. Um, you know, when our salespeople are out talking to a prospect, they're not just talking about today's problem. They're talking about the roadmap. They're, they're, they're showing the prospect a future, what a future could look like. Everybody else is trying to fix their website. We're showing them how to actually scale a business and make it become exitable. Changes the way we train changes the way we delegate because these milestones become something that, that can be documented processes. It actually has changed dramatically what services we offer. And I think that that's certainly, a, it can become, you know, when we develop these stages, uh, it, it almost suggests to us what we need to add next to our suite of services. And certainly from a hiring standpoint, uh, there's probably no stronger way to talk about uh, a business than to show somebody this customer success track and, and get them really thinking about you know, what's possible um, if, if somebody comes to work at your organization. I want to leave you with one uh, final thought. <clears throat> so as I was writing this book, I was listening to uh, one of my favorite podcasts, Seth Godin, Akimbo. I'm sure you're all, uh, many of you are familiar or, or maybe even fans. And Seth has at the end a, uh, a little uh, bit where he lets people call in and leave messages, ask questions, comments. And he plays a couple of those at the end of the show uh, and, and either answers the question or, or riffs on it a little bit. And this particular day, uh, Howard, who's a, a high school teacher in uh, New York, came on and, and said, you know, I want to talk about this idea of YOLO, right? We all, all have probably heard that. Heck, it's practically an entrepreneurial mantra as far as I'm concerned. I mean, we're all out there doing, you know, like we only live once in, in many cases. But Howard said, you know, my students will say that. I'll hear them say, you know, YOLO. And he said, you know, unfortunately, it's usually when they're about ready to go do something silly. So I asked him to rethink this idea. And I give him a challenge. I said, I want you to imagine that you're going to visit a friend today and you know that your friend is actually going to die soon, but they don't know it and you can't tell. I want you to consider a new phrase. I want you to consider TOLO. They only live once. Would that change your interaction at all? Now, <clears throat> I know this probably seems like a pretty deep <laughs> thought for a marketing talk, you know, digital uh, platform like this. But in hearing that, didn't you just feel a tiny shift? I wonder if the next prospect or the next customer or the next teammate you encountered, you went in with that point of view. Would it change it? I mean, because with all of these tactics, with all of the digital platforms, with all of the uh, supposed talk about you know, social media. At the end of the day, we're just human beings trying to produce value for other human beings. And we all only get to, to live once. So what if we acted like?
There's my contact information uh, on the screen. I'd love for you to reach out, ask any questions. Uh, you can find out more about the book at theultimatemarketingengine.com. So, Kenneth, if you've got any uh, questions that you want to hop back on and, uh, and ask me of any of our participants, I'm ready for those. The question from somebody beyond that sent me one. It said, how do we get management to understand this? Which is a great question because, you know, I think half the battle in anything we do uh, is trying to explain up to whether it's director, senior manager, CMO, CEO, CFO. Yeah. You know, try, trying to get a CFO to understand this and really, really make sense of how we make this shift is incredibly important. Yeah, it's a tough challenge. What I always tell people, typically the most potent weapon you can have is to show them what somebody else is doing. Um, and, and I think that that, especially somebody else that they are envious of or feel as a competitor, um, a lot of times that can be a way to start getting the conversation going. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I've worked with with hundreds of organizations now where um, actually just proposing the idea of getting however the organization structured marketing, sales and service or customer success, whatever they're, they're called to sit in the room one day and say, what happens when this happens? <laughs> what happens when a lead comes in? What happens when somebody signs a contract? You know, what happens when, uh, you know, and, and quite often you just immediately start identifying gaps. I mean, I, I've had a customer service person and a sales manager go, what do you mean? That's what you do when we give you an order. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and that can be, you know, that's where you see some of the gaps. That's where you see some of the miscommunication. Um, and because really for this to work, it it's, it's, should be a seamless end-to-end -end journey that everybody's participating in. So uh, another question that looks like it uh, came in as well is, where do we start? Where's a good place to start trying to make these changes? Well, the first one is, is map out. Let's figure out where the problem is. I mean, what exists today? <laughs> Um, because if you've got a business, if you've got customers, you, you're doing some of these things. Uh, it just may not be all of them and it may not be. I mean, you could probably enhance, you know, many of the things that you're doing. So so just simply ask your question. Ask those questions. How does somebody come to know about a business like ours? Um, you know, what would what would um, make somebody dislike? I, I hate to put it in the negative, but a lot of times that's what people need to hear first. What would make somebody dislike us at first impression? You know, what are we doing to, you know, to make sure that they can trust that that, that we're worth you know, our word or prove, you know, even that we've got uh, good, the goods or the solution? <laughs> Do we have any kind of try? Uh, what would somebody, you know, what would a try look like? Um, and, and again, as I said, people are trying your business you know, today, mm -hmm. whether you know it or not. Uh, so what are all the ways they are trying? And then just break it down. What 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 is your transaction process look like? What do you what's your communication look like? I mean, just go through all those stages and start identifying what exists today. And then I think you can turn around and say, what channel could we add to get people to know about us? Um, you know, what uh, you know, where do we have gaps? Um, you know, what needs to be fixed? What needs to be added? And, and I think once you start looking at, you know, all of those stages. Um, and, and, and understanding also that people's questions and objectives change at every stage. You know, when I'm not really sure how to solve my problem or what my problem even is, a lot of times I have different questions when I'm trying to decide, are you the right one to solve my problem? So understand that this really applies not just to, uh, to processes. You can do the same audit with your content. You know, a lot of times content is is probably the most stressful element of marketing today for a lot of marketers uh, because it's so much work. Um, and part of that is because, you know, we're waking up on Monday and saying, what are we going to blog about? Uh, what if you started thinking about your every piece of content in every format that you produce as as being content to serve one of these stages? Um, the beauty of that, and, and, and believe me, the the try, buy, repeat, and first stages need content. <laughs> uh, that's probably the first place to go. We're all good at producing content to get the, the click or the, you know, the like, um, but that, it's that after somebody becomes a customer. But if you, if you look at your content that way uh, and audit your content that way, pretty much every piece of content you produce, if you can peg it to one of those stages, it'll be valuable. It'll have use for you. I got a question from Gabriella who asked, let's see if I can read this right. So if somebody is is 
I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, if somebody is under the gun, if you will, you know, so to speak, if they're trying to make their numbers work and, and they've got their team breathing down their backs, uh, this is basically what she asked. You talked earlier about uh, making certain that somebody knows you and then yeah. we move to buy. Yep. At what point do you, I guess the way she was asking is where do you get them to stop in that process to engage a little bit more with them as a potential customer rather than as a customer? Well, and I think I, I've I, just butchered her question, but that's okay. the gist of what she was asking. And it's, you know, it, it's an age old uh, problem, especially for marketers who are in a department that are uh, certainly being asked to, you know, unfortunately, you know, many organizations believe that, you know, sales and marketing are the same thing. Um, and, you know, that's where the real challenge comes. Uh, how many CMOs at organizations, you know, are the former sales director? Um, and, and that's where the real cultural kind of clash, you know, starts happening. You know, marketing is about actually being able to charge a premium <laughs> for what it is that, right. that you do. Um, and that, you know, in a, in a sales only environment, what you're really doing at that point is competing on price. Um, now, how do you practically get somebody to understand that? Yeah. Maybe, maybe you have to do it by leap. <laughs> so I'm thinking about a duct tape marketing uh, only jacket. Yes. Yes. I so, like it. Yeah, I like it. Uh, so <clears throat> where do people get in touch with you, John, one more time? You bet. You bet. So the easiest place is really just... Uh, John at ducttapemarketing.com. Uh, duct tape marketing is where, you know, if you want to see everything I've done, and, you know, this is this book, The Ultimate Marketing Engine is actually my seventh book. So if you, you want to see everything else that's going on there, but the, this newest book, which is really, you know, what, uh, what today's topic uh, was taken from um, is you can find a lot about it at just the ultimate marketing engine.com. I downloaded it, but haven't listened yet. Who's on the uh, show this week? Um, you know, that is a great question, Kenneth. I record these, <laughs> you well, know, we, we got to go we, check it out so weeks ago. Out. And then I don't know who uh, actually gets uh, published. We do two shows a week. Um, yeah. and, uh, this is just Wednesday. We actually publish Wednesday and Thursday. So the, today's show probably, um, it, it is out. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Perfect. Well, John, it's an honor again to, to oh. get to hear from you and, and, uh, I've heard this presentation now several times and love it. And it's uh, fantastic. And I want to wish you the absolute best luck. Thank you for kicking off an amazing session to start Digimarcon World. Well, I hope I've made the bar very high uh, for, yeah. for everybody. <laughs> for and, everybody as you say, <laughs> and as you say, and I did get to see you out on the road, but hope to see you out on the road again soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how about Hawaii? I'm waiting for my invite. Yes, to sir. Hawaii. Yes, all indeed. Right, want, okay. Keynotes, keynotes are all around for, for a, a little bit of a palm tree and some, That's right. some wonderful weather. All right, buddy, have a great day and I appreciate it. Take care.